So I've been given the task of, you know, we've got the debate here, and it's always, these are always the fun ones, but this, unfortunately, I've been given the easy part, which is supporting what we all, most of us are practicing, which is uh, the full SWOG course, uh, and so we'll make this pretty quick. And you've heard a lot of it already uh, from Dr. Cookson, so we'll kind of, unfortunately, have no financial disclosures. Um, so I'll briefly review the SWOG course. I'm not going to do too much because this has already been reviewed by Mike. And, uh, and you know, then the next question is, you know, guidelines, um, what's recommended, white papers, and it's really easy to sit in a committee uh, and say what everybody should be doing because you might have your practice, your environment in an academic institution or ivory tower, and then other people have other things and other considerations, and patients are different, and they're not all the same. And there's a lot of things that a lot of these studies haven't controlled for, and we'll, you know, briefly talk on that. So I think knowing what really happens is another issue, right? What really is going on uh, for all of these patients and their ability to get back to the office and things like that. But ultimately, you know, I'm going to share with you that I do, I am a believer in BCG because I think it's really one thing or the other. Either BCG works or it doesn't work. It's one or the other. I don't, I don't, I'm not as much, I don't buy into that there's kind of a in-between road. Either patients have an immune system that's going to respond appropriately or they don't. Some of you have maybe been at this course before, have seen some of the basic work we've done uh, showing that, uh, you know, we, and, and really this is now supported by all the pd one and PD-1 work that's being done uh, demonstrating that either your immune system is ready to be primed or it isn't. So the classic uh, you know, SWOG study that was, uh, you know, published in, I think it was in 2000, uh, that was headed up by, uh, you know, a large group of well-known bladder cancer experts, in, in particular Don Lamb, I don't know if he's here today, he often comes to this meeting, uh, was the Connaught strain. And the bottom line was you, you got induction BCG, and then you had it at three, and, and the induction was once a week for six weeks, uh, and then you had once a week for three weeks at three, six, 12, 18, 24, 30, and 36 months. And it's once a week for three weeks. And, you know, there are variations on that because ultimately what you're getting is essentially three, three years, every three months for the first roughly first year, and then every six months for the remaining, you know, two years of kind of stimulating that immune system again, kind of revaccinating, if you will. And, and I think it's a lot more complicated than just stimulating a Th1 response or that, you know, cell-mediated response in the body because we know that patients that, whether they're PPD positive or not, it may or may not make a difference on how they respond. No different than whether someone's pdl one positive or not, if a tumor is, whether it'll respond to our immunotherapy that's out there. So it's definitely much more complex than this, but this is what we've got and this is how it works. So why do we recommend it? And really it comes down to this. And that is that in just about every randomized or retrospective study that is out there, maintenance gives you a significantly decreased uh, risk of recurrence. And the original study demonstrated almost, you know, half the recurrence rates uh, when you, uh, as far as recurrence-free survival, you know, it was 76 months uh, with, when you were on maintenance, but it was only 35 months or 36 months when uh, you had no maintenance. So it's really hard to argue with that. Now, how could you argue with it? They use the Connaught strain. It's really not available here in the U.S. I think everybody uses TICE. Right now, there's a trial, the uh, Tokyo trial, which is the SWOG S, uh, S1602, looking at trying to come up with some other strains for us to potentially use, which is the Tokyo, I think it's 172 strain, uh, one arm compared to BCG, standard TICE BCG, uh, versus the Tokyo strain with an actual uh, vaccination 21 days prior to getting it, so that we can have uh, other options. We've all lived in that world of, you know, BCG, uh, not being available to us or to our patients and having to, um, you know, essentially strategize who's going to receive it. And that's when we all cut back on maintenance, you might remember. I'm sure all of us have enc encountered that years ago. Um, so the one thing that wasn't determined by this trial was, did it really change significantly the risk of going on to cystectomy or getting radiation or some sort of systemic therapy? And, and that wasn't really measurable. I don't know that the trial was necessarily uh, defined, designed well for that. And our, people who argue against maintenance or using maintenance to this degree um, would say that the overall survival was the same and in the two groups, roughly a difference of 5 to 8 percent, nothing all that significant. What else, and what do I use, I'll tell you here in a second, but what else are the other issues with this trial? Well, there's a lot of factors, even Dr. Cookson has shown you, how well you resect the patient originally is going to impact how well uh, the patient is going to do from BCG. You, you can't just leave them full of tumor and give them BCG. It's not going to work. I mean, you effectively have to have a little bit of a raw surface after the resection, so you want to do it at about three weeks, 
You know, no, no later than a month to, f to six weeks because otherwise you might have new tumors and you need to re-resect. Gross tumor doesn't respond to BCG, okay? Um, and the other issue is, that, so these trials didn't control for the TURBT and the, and the quality or the effectiveness of it. And also, uh, they didn't control necessarily for how the vaccine was given, how many interruptions there were. You know, patients come in, they have a UA that's positive, then they get pushed off, or they might have hematuria. All of these things that are very challenging to control for in any trial. Um, but what do I tend to use? I actually use a little extra BCG. Because as I said before, I'm a believer that either you're a responder or you're not a responder. And what that comes from is um, most of us think that BCG stimulates that cell-mediated immune response. Now, why a person gets a tumor in the first place, if your body's doing the right thing, is it should be manifesting a cell-mediated immune, uh, immune response. And why these tumors are there is either one of two things, in my opinion. Uh, and again, this is opinion. We have one study that's been published, and I've demonstrated here at, uh, at this meeting in the past, is that either your immune system didn't do the right thing and you have a tumor, or immune system did the right thing and the tumor has evaded the immune system. And that's where I think the whole PD-L1, PD-1 thing has come, out, uh, come into play and why we're going to see these trials like atezolizumab that Dr. Cookson talked about. And, and although those drugs seem to be the panacea for everything at this point, but we'll see. Just like when TKIs came out for renal cell, you know, we all have to uh, temper a little little bit of our excitement. But nevertheless, because I think people are responders, and we've all seen these patients that come in with CIS or high-grade T1, you resect them, you put them on BCG, and five years later, you still haven't had a recurrence of any high-risk disease. You might have, you know, a little TA here and there, um, but those are the ones that I think benefit the most. I also believe, and a lot of people have demonstrated, that if they actually uh, have significant symptoms, those irritative symptoms they keep calling your office about, they've manifested a dramatic immune response and they often do the best as well. Um, so I ramp it up if it's working. And so I tend to do actually every three months uh, until they get, so it's one extra treatment, so it's three, six, nine, and 12, uh, and then they get 18 months of Q6. Um, I use it in every CIS patient and T1. Uh, I, as far as TA, there are some people who will use it even in low-grade TA when you have recurrences because, you know, you've resected them, then they come back again, and you resect them, and you come out, and you think you should use a BCG. While it's a, appropriate and you can consider using it, I really don't use it as often. I think high-grade TA is something that is high-risk disease, and you should use uh, BCG uh, very judiciously in those patients because uh, oftentimes I think they're not resected enough, and it's that enhanced cystoscopy that's going to make a difference. So what happens in the real world? We've kind of referred to this already. Some patients miss a dose, sometimes more than one, and some miss several. They can't get through their maintenance. Uh, so that's one of the downsides to BCG is that tolerance is an issue. Uh, some of these patients will have such significant urinary symptoms and their UAs come back or their gram stains come back and everybody has a different way of determining who's going to get their BCG that day. But all of those uh, play, an, uh, play a role in influencing how we treat our patients. Finally, some patients have their own ideas of what they want to do. You know, they don't necessarily want BCG. Uh, they don't want to come to the office as frequently. Uh, it's not that easy for some patients if you're drawing from multiple communities. And so I think you have to really strategize also for those patients as well. So what's the conventional wisdom? I think the conventional wisdom is that BCG is for CIS and high-grade T1. It's interesting because I, I can very rarely imagine or count on one hand how often I see low-grade T1 that was in the guidelines just as a comment. I mean, you almost start to suspect whether the pathology was read appropriately. Um, uh, I think you need to get induction on board within about three to four weeks from the resection. There used to be this fear of, you know, BCGosis. And I think that if you get a good response and your first um, uh, surveillance cysto, which we do in the operating room, actually, and re-biopsy and go and re-resect, and to me, that's the most definitive way to know if someone uh, responded to their therapy. Um, well, what are the harms? Well, you know, I think BCGosis, I cannot honestly remember the last time I had such significant BCGosis that the patient had to be admitted to the hospital, you know, dosed up with steroids and the appropriate anti-TB drugs. All of those things, they're so infrequent, even though they're, you know, it's out there and such a concern. Um, it is inconvenient to do BCG frequently and for some patients, and I think you have to then tailor your treatment based on what their availability is to come in. Uh, and I think you need to decide with your patients what your goals are. You know, you have some patients who are trying to spare their bladder and salvage their bladder as long as possible. What are the comorbidities you need to take into account? All of those factors. Are they on steroids? Uh, for polymyalgia rheumatica, and then you may not want to use BCG and, and try some alternative therapy. All of these things uh, play a role. But ultimately, at the end of the day, 
The data speaks for itself. It's in the guidelines. It's been ref uh, uh, referenced numerous times. And I would just say, just do it. Do your maintenance BCG and decide for yourself and your patients whether you find the ones that can't tolerate it or you have a recurrence, and then you can go you know, the other way following the guidelines. Um, so finally, after 18 months with no recurrence, does it really matter? That's the real question. Should you go to three years? I think yes. And I usually tell my patients, it's working. Why ruin a good thing? Uh, you know, we can sit here and say, question whether we shouldn't, but if they're tolerating it well, all they're going to get is about three or four more treatments. Uh, you might as well finish it up. Does it really decrease recurrences? Yes. Does it matter if they have symptoms? I say yes, and then you should give them even more because I think they're having a great response. You just got to find a way to make that happen.